Okay, um, good evening everyone. Thank you for, for coming to this, the third of five Asia Trends lectures organized by the Asia Research Institute, or what we call ARI. Uh, my name is Tim Bunnell. I'm based at ARI and uh, also in the Department of Geography at NUS. The main aim of these Asia Trends lectures is to bring academic debates off campus, in Ari's case, off Bukitima campus, uh, and into public spaces like this one, to engage uh, an educated but not merely academic uh, audience. Ari is a university-level social science and humanities research institute, which was established back in 2001. Research at ARI is organized around a series of transdisciplinary research clusters. And tonight's theme of livable cities relates in particular to the interests of our urban studies cluster, the Asian urbanisms cluster, which our distinguished speaker tonight, uh, Professor Mike Douglas, leads. Before I introduce Prof Douglas, uh, let me tell you, or, or perhaps in some cases remind you, about the format of these Asia Trends events. So first we'll have the Asia Trends Lecture, which will last for around 40 minutes. Then we'll have uh, discussions comments of around 15 to 20 minutes. And then we'll open up to comments and questions uh, from all of you. So first, uh, and our main speaker tonight, is Professor Mike Douglas. Until very recently, Professor of Urban and Regional Planning at the University of Hawaii, but now happily here with us at Barry, uh, and jointly appointed with the Department of Sociology in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at NUS. Professor Douglas is eminently qualified to fulfill the remit of this lecture series in making Asian regional trends and transitions speak to issues and concerns that are global in scope. At the University of Hawaii, one of the many hats that he wore was as director of the Global Globalization Research Institute. But in terms of his own empirical research and professional practice, Professor Douglas has been very much focused on Asia for at least two decades. Um, he has a wealth of knowledge on cities across a range of countries in the region, which means that the implications of his work are always, I think, more than local, but also often defy regional generalization. A key theme in Professor Douglas's work is civil society activity and the possibilities for ordinary people in Asia to make and remake cities in line with their own aspirations. This is certainly a prominent theme in the influential volume Cities for Citizens that I read as a graduate student in the 1990s, uh, as well as in much more recent publications such as Globalization, the Rise of Civil Society, and Civic Spaces in Pacific Asia Cities. Civil society and grassroots urban activity also feature in a recent film that Professor Douglas has made, Dancing in the Park, Hanoi at its Millennium, as well as in tonight's lecture in relation to issues of livability. We are delighted that uh, Professor Douglas has agreed to be our main speaker tonight. So as I said, Professor Douglas will talk for 40 minutes, after which we'll have around 20 minutes of discussion. Our discussant, Professor Stephen Cairns, who's further away from me, is an eminent urban scholar in his own right. Like Professor Douglas, Prof Cairns has moved to Singapore relatively recently, in his case to take up the position of scientific coordinator of the Future Cities Laboratory uh, in the Singapore ETH Centre. It's in that intriguing building called the Create Building that you can see from the AYE. But in addition to this, Professor Cairns also retains his position as Professor of Architecture and Urbanism at the University of Edinburgh in the UK. He has a wealth of experience of research on urbanization in Southeast Asia, especially in Indonesia, and his connection with Indonesia goes back much further. He was born in Indonesia, spent the first five or six years of his life, I'm told, in Indonesia, and at one time could speak Sundanese and Javanese, as well as Bahasa Indonesia, which is incredibly impressive. Um, which is which how to talk about that. Uh, <laughs> Professor Cairn's uh, list of recent publications includes The Sage Handbook of Architectural Theory, and I know also that he's finishing up, or perhaps has recently finished up, um, a co-authored book on Architecture and Waste, or MIT Press. Quite clearly, Professor Cairn's 
It is very well placed to add comments to Professor Douglas's lecture before we open up for the question and answer session. Okay, so without further ado, I invite Professor Mike Douglas to deliver the third Asia Trends lecture for 2012 with the title, yes, it's the one I have on my sheet, Asia in Transition, Making Livable Cities at the, at the Grassroots in a Global Age. Thank you, Jim. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Singapore for welcoming me here from Hawaii. And uh, everyone has been very gracious and helpful. And I'm feeling very comfortable in moving in here. So thank you to you on the, and, and further out and to Singapore. Uh, Tim was wrong about the two decades. I was looking at the calendar, and I realized it's been almost five decades. Uh, so, in a way, as one of my mentors told me, all thought is autobiographical. Uh, my review of the history of cities and urbanization in Asia is also going to be about my own life in traveling and living in Asia. I've lived in Japan, Korea, Indonesia, now Singapore, and, and other places uh, for many years. And um, we are now in a, an era of the most intensive changes in cities ever. And I'm trying to make sense of that. But from the perspective of uh, ordinary people, people who live in cities and, and find their own lives. So let me start. This is the world's first urban century in the sense that uh, more than half of people in the planet are now going to be living in cities are, uh, and therefore we have to ask some serious questions. Why are we doing this? It's a tremendous amount of social, political, and economic energy to build cities. And we're doing it everywhere on the planet. What do we expect of the city in terms of uh, our own happiness? What is a livable city? And are we making cities more livable? These are the kinds of questions I want to ask. So to start with, we can, uh, I just want to put out some parameters of what uh, the idea of livable cities should be about. Uh, it is human-centered. It's, it's about the quality of human life. It's holistic in the sense that you can't leave something out. You have to take everything that you think is a part of livability and include it. It would be unfair to talk only about the economy of a livable city without talking about uh, the other aspects. So the initial design must try to encompass as much as you uh, feel is necessary in the idea of livable cities. It is necessarily, too, a long-term perspective that we're looking at the kinds of human endeavors that take more than a few months or a year, but something that moves into the future. And I am adding to it, it must reflect and enable choices and aspirations of the residents of the city. If it doesn't do that, then we're uh, going to be having liberal cities designed by people who live far away and sit in armchairs. So I start this by uh, trying to figure out what is the idea of the city, and I start a historical exploration of that. It's of course a very broad brush stroke that I can only present in this limited time. Cities, uh, where they started 4,000, 8,000, 10,000 years ago, depending on who you talk to, uh, were characterized by non-producers of agricultural commodities, and therefore they had to get things from the countryside. In so doing, legitimating power is dependent on some form of higher power, and so we find that religious principles were often invoked to uh, legitimate governments. And so we have, from the Greek Agora to, to older Beijing, the idea of the city under heaven. Uh, just point out, one of the slides here, the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, is actually Emperor uh, Constantine giving a model of Constantinople to baby Jesus as the most precious gift he could give to his uh, form of God. The Enlightenment in the West, the Enlightenment and you, uh, comes along in the idea that we can reason, we can think on our own, and we can actually divine our own futures. 
with or without gods. And uh, of course, we get Thomas More, the famous uh, treatise on utopia. We have, from this point on, a very long lineage of um, treatments that can be classified as utopian. But what we should realize is, in addition to talking about something in the future, their general uh, purpose was to actually criticize the present. And that is probably one of the greatest uses of utopian thinking, is to let us to, to think about today, what's going wrong with today. We might laugh or smile at some of the kinds of things that Thomas More might have talked about. Um, but at the time, because it's historically contingent, but the idea that we could think about a better city is a long one, a long history of that. The, in, in the West, again, the major point at which we can trace modern urban planning starts with the uh, rise of capitalism and industrial capitalism, in particular in the UK and parts of Europe, and the reaction to the horrific cities that capitalism was creating, not only in terms of human lives, but also in terms of the environment and just general degradation. This was coupled with a, a whole stream of utopian socialists that even started to build their own towns. So the Owenites, for example, built uh, small towns in the UK and in the United States as well. Actually existed. These were not just ideas that were in a book, but actually put into practice. The, uh, but the birth of modern planning, urban planning, can actually be traced mostly to Ebenezer Howard, who at the late, in the late 1900s, or just at the turn of the 20th century, came forth with the idea of garden cities. And this has been transformed into all kinds of developer schemes in, in, over time, but started out as a very progressive uh, idea of mixing countryside and the city, getting the best of both, and had a very uh, large dose of common property, common interest that over time became private property and private interests. What I'd like to point out though that is that uh, Garden Cities, by the way, Ebenezer Howard also uh, became the founder of the Regional Planning Association of the United States, was very influential as a person in starting a lot of professional activities. What I'd like to say is, but he was not a government official and he was not a private businessman. He preached from the pulpit and from community centers. He was a citizen uh, promoting this idea. So it, it's kind of ironic that we talk about planning as a government activity or a private sector activity when its origins are actually from civil society. Uh, into the 20th century, we get a, a, the icons of modernism. Uh, Le Corbusier, for example, or not for example, the Le Corbusier, there are even societies in his name still today, um, in which you start to build cities on mathematical formula, and uh, it's a scheme that only the master planner can know. People should not be involved in designing these cities. Rather, it's an expert who uh, knows best for you. It's geometrical. Uh, Every city's function is in this place, mass-produced housing, tall buildings to allow spaces for environmental and open spaces. And his ideas, of course, were actually implemented in places like Brasilia and the Chandigarh and other places around the world, actually implemented. But this is a very famous photo in 1972 when uh, a Corbusier-like public housing was blown up, intentionally. This was not terrorist, I should add. <laughs> uh, because it didn't work. It was socially a mess in terms of crime and dysfunctional uh, uh, life. So this says, uh, only 15 years after it was built, this Pruitt Evo project in St. Louis, United States, was torn down, uh, and uh, some postmodernists call this the moment of the end of modernism. Right? When the idea of the master planner that knows everything, that planning is a technical process, is not only challenged by uh, scholars, but is actually failed in reality. You can take that with a grain of salt if you'd like, because of course modernism still goes on. 
But nonetheless, it is a moment in which there's an, uh, in planning, urban planning, where I'm, which I'm trained in, had a kind of uh, angst about what it was and who should be doing planning, because the modernist planner, expert planner, was no longer the main icon. So since about 1970s, planning itself has been trying to find its way. And one of the uh, icons of that change is Jane Jacobs, who died just a couple of years ago in her 90s, who uh, in very short said that uh, the problem with planning is the planner. The planner is ruining the cities. Let people build their own cities. Let people be messy and chaotic. They, they know what they're doing, so to speak. And uh, her popularity is such that if you look at this lower photograph, it's young women with Jane Jacobs wigs and glasses, thinking like Superman, if they put those on, they're empowered, and they can march anywhere in the city and get a Jane Jacobs job done. So uh, this shows you the iconic uh, feature that, that uh, Jane Jacobs has. And she's quite, was quite beautiful. She, uh, she walked every city she studied. It was one of her principles. Don't talk about a city unless you walked it. Which is pretty hard to do. I'm from Los Angeles, I would never. <laughs> Could run over the freeway. Okay, so. In summary, uh, at this point, in, in the overview of what is the idea of the city, I was searching for uh, the leading scholars about the city, and two names came up, Lewis Mumford, who uh, made films and talked about the exciting possibility of the city in the 20th, early 20th century, and John Friedman, who is probably the father, godfather of urban planning theory. And here's what they said. The idea of the city is a publicly governed sphere of social life. The city is a theater of social action and an aesthetic symbol of collective unity. Its social facts are primary, the physical organization of the city, its industries and its markets. Its lines of communication traffic must be subservient to social needs. Okay, mark that in your notes. Economy and infrastructure is subservient to social needs. This is very uh, uh, Polanyi-like, that uh, society has an economy, not the economy has a society. And, uh, John Freeman just writes very simply, the city is the form of collective life with a common interest. Why do I say 1980s? Because uh, 1980s we have a sea change starting in the idea of the city. And we're still living with that change. Now we have, uh, in Asia, what I would call neo-developmentalism. But in the West it's called neoliberalism. The difference being that in Asia you still have strong states involved with neoliberalism. And it's quite astonishing to me to, to see that instead of the city as a social experience, it's now almost purely an economic experience. Cities everywhere are makers of wealth, magnets for the industrious, motors of invention. The city is an engine of growth. I can't tell you how many meetings I've been to recently where this is the leading statement. Uh, so much so that uh, another part of the vocabulary is competitiveness. It's now slammed on us so often that we believe it must be true without even investigating it. And uh, the so-called uh, Economist Intelligence Unit, or intelli yeah, Intelligence Unit, has now calculated a, an index of urban competitiveness. And so we are uh, asked to orient our lives toward competition, and toward making our city competitive, toward uh, engine of growth, and all of this stuff. This is very different. Uh, I looked in this long report of The Economist, which is available, by the way, online, and uh, I looked, well, where is culture? Where is society? And I found this phrase, for competitiveness, the social and cultural character of the city has been weighed at 5%. Right? So now you know, 
your culture and your associational life is equal to 5% of the value of your city. Um, it's, a, it's a tremendous change. And ideology matters. The ideas that are presented to us, why we are living in cities, do matter because our governments get invested in them as well. The epitome of what uh, the competitive city, which never speaks of public space, by the way, never speaks of culture or associational life, is uh, the epitome of that is Future X, uh, a town, a, kind, a new kind of uh, town formation that's appearing in Korea. In essence, it's a, uh, a series of residential units sitting on top of very large shopping malls. And its claim is that's your entire life, is that you will come down the elevator, shop uh, with a magic wand to your, or your iPhone, you can buy things before you get there, you never have to talk to another person, and pick them up and go back upstairs to your, uh, to your condo. These are being built, they're massive in scale, they're also being built in China, and I think you can see uh, equivalents in many places. Um, according to director Yu, the founder of Ubiquitous City, Yu means ubiquitous, right? There are only two reasons for making a city. One is consumption, another is profit. That's it. So let me talk now about Asia's uh, urban transition over the last uh, several decades. And I want to talk about the rise of uh, what I call mega-urban regions, what others call mega-cities. And we'll see here, it's very hard to see this first graph, but basically shows you that the number of cities of over 5 or 10 million uh, were very small in 1960, and now they're virtually everywhere, but particularly in Asia. So the, the largest cities in the world, in terms of numbers of large cities, are all in, in Asia. Um, and that trend is going to continue. And it doesn't matter what part of Asia you're in, the trajectory is toward what we call an urban transition, a transition to urban-centered societies. Um, this is just a little interesting map that shows you the size of cities in 1891 and the size of cities 1931 during the height of, of colonialism, imperialism. This is a very important period, of course, in Southeast Asia because most of the cities today were created actually under the colonial era. And, pardon me, and many of them did not even exist in any significant size before then. By the time, uh, by 1945 or thereafter, the pattern of urbanization in, in East and Southeast Asia is pretty much set in terms of which cities are going to be favored. And most of the cities that are favored are going to be coastal. And indeed, that's the case. This graph is uh, one I put together with Professor Kevin Jones when we did a study of mega urban regions. What, uh, th this led me to a lot of research, this very graph, because it shows you that before around 1950, cities were pretty small. And they were pretty small for a long time. Of course, Asia had uh, large empires in Southeast Asia, Angkor is reportedly a million people and so forth, but it didn't have cities of 10 million or 20 million or 30 million. Right? And so what this graph is showing you is a long history of cities uh, existing but not growing very much, and then suddenly they take off. And the question is why and what, what's the dynamics behind them. Uh, of course, we can also simply say that this is a, a, a phenomenon that's related to population boom. Right? Because after wars and so forth in, in the 1950s, the, there is just a population explosion. But in fact, that doesn't explain it. Something else is going on. And so I have this stylized graph. Uh, it's a little bit complicated, but basically it's saying there are three or four phases in which cities in Asia uh, experience global impulses that generate their dynamics. The long history is, uh, number one, is uh, simply cities as uh, parasites, cities that are exploiting the countryside, taking resources. They are not 
the World Bank engines of growth. Uh, they do not have their own freestanding or globally linked economies, but they're actually transport nodes or, uh, in the case of colonialism, plantations and other kinds of crops. It's only in the 1960s and particularly 70s when you have the advent of the, what's called the New International Division of Labor, which means that for the first time, uh, industrialization is, is moving out of the global north and into east and southeast Asia in particular. So industrialization becomes possible and cities become the centers of industrialization. If that were the only story, then we would just say, well, the rest of history is simply the industrialization of cities, but it's not so. I claim around 1985, another, I call, circuit of capital, which is consumption and finance, start to uh, appear or penetrate into East and Southeast Asian cities, and they become the drivers of particularly large urban region growth. It's no longer industrialization. Industrialization is now being peripheralized and pushed out to other cities. So this has a, also a very important impact on building cities and what goes on inside of them. But let's look at the pre-colonial, pre-capitalist urban landscapes. I think there's some common points that you'll find around the world in this regard. Uh, for example, walls. Most cities were walled. And they were small and compact. Most cities uh, were under the authority of a religion and the military, of course, that went with it. Religion or royalty, and they often mixed together. Com uh, commerce could be restricted by the gates, by uh, fiat. High imperialism produced its own landscapes, and we have those in Singapore as well. <coughs> totally transform some places like Batavia, which is now Jakarta, and we can go to Saigon and see the, the old uh, French headquarters is now the People's Party Center. Okay, let's start with the 1960s, though, the National Development Round 1, I call it. That's when export-oriented industrialization comes to Asia, and it's the first instance where cities themselves start to take off in terms of uh, promoting or propelling their own growth. The kinds of changes that took place in the 1960s and 70s were really external to the city, not in the core. This is important because uh, the core is not really going to change that much until later. And these are the forms of export processing zones, container ports, international airports. All the things that you needed to connect your industrial estate to the global uh, sourcing of that. What was happening in the center of the city? Well. We had the rise of what's called developmental states, strong states that had to legitimate themselves by providing economic growth and the material benefits. And symbolically doing that through, uh, in the case of Taipei, the Shanghai Shek Memorial, which of course was built after he died in 76, Ho Chi Minh and others. Uh, so what's happening in the core of the city is a new iconic architecture that is symbolizing uh, development under the nation state, whether it's communist or social or, or capitalist. Okay, so from 1985, something happens in 1985. Again, one could say it could be 1984 or three or whatever, but a lot of things happened uh, about that time. One of the most important was Endaka, which is the uh, doubling of the value of the Japanese yen to the Plaza Accord, which made, uh, first of all, Japanese exports very expensive, so Japan starts to, for the first time, uh, move its industries into Southeast Asia. Uh, and at the same time, uh, it propels Korea and Taiwan and Singapore also to do a similar thing. So you have um, this, this urge to now uh, link Asia with Asia through industrial linkage. Same time you have an expanding middle class. The, the payoff of the new international division of labor was to create a rather large middle class that wanted to consume global products, or at least they were told they would want to consume, and they did. So shopping malls and, and these kinds of things start to appear for the first time. In Jakarta, I think the first McDonald's opened in 1984, a landmark year 
for the opening of that country to global capital and global franchise consumption. We did, the, in the 1990s, uh, the globalization of finance capital, which in, in one way means that banks in Asia were compelled to take short-term uh, deposits and be open to global investment. This brought in billions of dollars. Uh, partly under a man named George Soros, who organized that. Uh, but uh, it meant also the capital could leave overnight, which it did. So 1997-98, that was a great finance crisis in East and Southeast Asia, had uh, mostly to do with the opening and the capriciousness of a finance capital that could come and go in a very short order. Neoliberalism, which in uh, short form means small state, let the market do the work, don't subsidize anybody, uh, that came online in the 1980s with Thatcher and Reagan, but also came to Asia through the Washington Accord and World Bank. World Bank, which now I think requires privatization as a, as a part of its uh, loan package. Cities, though, governments started to find out that they had these major cities that, that they couldn't let go, that they had to keep promoting them, but they're no longer industrial cities. So how can you promote national development based around a capital city that is now 10 million or 20 million in size. Lo and behold, a literature started to appear called World Cities, Global Cities. Let's make our city a global city. And that will be our new way to stay at the top of the world system of cities. So you find from the 1985 onward, this overt presentation of cities as world cities, as global cities. Well, how do you do that? You need to build tall buildings. You need to do all of the things uh, that symbolically identify you as a world city. So uh, this is, since 1985, we have the most massive transformation of Asian cities really ever, with a few exceptions. You have private new towns, mega malls, world's tallest buildings, hub airports, and on and on it goes. Uh, what's partly propelling that, I just want to show this briefly, this is a, a graph of global investment by recipient regions. And the red line over here is East and Southeast Asia. Basically what they're showing is that Latin America is falling, uh, the rest of the world is not doing well. Almost all of the global investment in a particular industry or in cities is coming to East and Southeast Asia. It's not going to the rest of the world generally. So it, if one talks about the decentralization of industrialization from the north, it's really only talking about a handful of countries, and most of them in East and South Asia. So the race is on for global cities, and now we can find indicators. Uh, people are measuring them, and these are some examples of global cities index. And here's how you do that. Uh, Petronas Twin Towers was first a only 452 meters, small by today's standards, but then the tallest building in the world, and still today the tallest twin towers in the world. Jakarta is now, look at Petronas Tower is 452. Jakarta wants a 1,200 meter tower. Um, signature tower of 640 in I don't have it here, but in uh, in Busan, Korea, and in Seoul, they're planning buildings of 150 stories. Right? Uh, Taipei 101 is 101. That was after Petronas Towers. So the race is on, and we're going to be a world city by building you the tallest building. No other region in the world except parts of the Middle East is doing this. The United States is not doing it. Europe is not doing it. Asia is doing it. Um, other things are happening at a more modest scale. I uh, show you the two photos of the public market and the supermarket. The last public market is being closed in Hanoi. we be replaced by supermarkets. We often think of this from the consumer's point of view, but I, I ask you to pause a moment and think of this from the worker's point of view. And you can see immediately in these two photos the sociability of the open market. The fact that you can sit and chat with your customers, there are no police around, 
what they are, they scroll through. Over here at the supermarket, you're not allowed to sit down if you work inside. You're not allowed to chat with another worker. You've got guards by turnstiles. What are these turnstiles for? There's an immediate suspicion that comes to the supermarket that is not in the open market. So th this is really a fundamental social change that's going on with this kind of uh, shift toward consumption globally. We get the advent of private, actually this is the most important in terms of scale phenomenon happening now in Southeast Asia. In peri-urban metropolitan regions that are being filled by private new towns that have no public space, that have no public anything. And because they're made by uh, faraway corporations, they also don't have any local content, but instead they, they play with history by giving you a sphinx or Cowboys and Indians, or the uh, Mount Rushmore, all in Jakarta, but no Indonesia. So, to make the longer story short, since 1980, we have this layering of new forms of built environment that we hadn't seen before, and it's really massive, and it's hitting the heart of the city, not just the edges. This is the condition that we must concern ourselves with. Whether we're in favor of it or not, we must take the time to think about it. At the same time, uh, I didn't go on very much, but this is polarizing spatially into very large mega-urban regions. We even have, on the other side, shrinking cities. In Japan, they're starting to decline. So the Tokyo, Greater Tokyo and Kanto, it's called, has now 40 million people, which is one third of the entire population of Japan. Seoul, Korea has half of the population of Korea. And on and on it goes. These are now connecting up in various ways through either land, sea, or air. But particularly interesting is by land, uh, train, fast trains, and other kinds of connections. I would imagine in the future we will have this corridor that will extend from Japan to Java. So, uh, now I want to enter uh, the other side of the coin. I only have five minutes. Okay. I decided that I wanted to see what people thought about their own livable city. So, a few years ago, I uh, had a photo contest in Hanoi, and I uh, put it on online. Online is quite accessible to many people, school kids too, to ask people to send in their photos that they took of livable Hanoi. And there was only one a limit. You could not have a tourist photo that you're trying to impress people with. The, the photo had to have meaning to you. And so we had all these photos, 2,600, we had judges, we had an exhibition and prizes. First prize was a trip to Singapore. <laughs> Imagine that. Okay, here are some of the photos that, that came from this contest. I won't explain them, and I have to be quick because of time. Well, I will explain this one. This uh, new town, which is Sikutra, put on top of this field that grows, uh, I think it's peach blossoms for the, uh, for, uh, the annual uh, New Year's festival, killed all the plants, and this man is rescuing the last peach tree to rejuvenate it for the cultural meaning of it. So he became a hero. Uh, street scenes that one can find in, the, in Hanoi today. I asked the woman who organized the contest, what do you feel after you've seen all these photos? Her answer was, soon they'll all be gone. Uh, a couple of cases, again, time is, is at premium here, but let me just quickly describe it. Uh, a small community in Hanoi uh, decided to join together and to renovate this uh, derelict common square that had drug users, prostitution, all kinds of of undesirable elements. They joined together through an action of an NGO to meet and to do all of this planning. And a local hero, this woman who has a construction company, gets the materials together. And after completion, uh, it, it not only regenerated this public space for them, but it became a, a platform for synergies to have more projects and more projects. And it, uh, the, the amount of money cost was very, very small. Thailand has a national livable city program that is including the social and cultural life of cities. One case in point is Klang, 
uh, municipality down in the south uh, of Thailand, in which they, among other things, they have children measuring the quality of the river water to see if the rivers improve. Why children? Because experts could do it, but the children become vested in it. The parents become vested in it. The community wants to do it. And they feel this kind of efficacy of joining in and protecting the environment. In other words, it's the sociability and the conviviality of managing the environment, the environment that is the key. Without it, this would not have happened. And uh, again, more positive synergistic outcomes of this. In Taipei, when democracy came in the late 80s and uh, the DPP first came to power as the mayor, they gave money to non-government organizations to work with people to renovate the city. One of them was a park in which the people themselves joined together to remake their park. Tore down the fence, moved Chiang Kai-shek's statue to the corner after much debate, and uh, put a stage in for their own performances and so forth. People making their own city. So, in conclusion, what I want to say is there are a lot of these activities going on, but we're not really looking at them very much. We tend to look at the big picture only. At the same time, if you want to know what a livable city is, you have to have people tell you what their livability concerns are. Uh, too much of livable cities kinds of uh, activities are done from offices far away with indicators that have nothing really meaningful to the people who live in cities. So you cannot separate the process of defining what is a livable city from the outcomes. Who's involved, whose voice is involved in defining livability will tell you what the outcomes will be. It's that simple. Okay, my last one, a little quiz to you all. Which city is the future city? Some architects in the audience here. Uh, does anyone know this one in the top, top right? MIT. MIT. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more. Yeah. This is, actually exists. This is not. Uh, okay. And the other, the other two, I think, are quite common. We would see in future cities kind of stuff. But of course, that's not the only one. The reason I do this is because over there in the bottom is Amsterdam, right? And Amsterdam has been Amsterdam pretty much like that for our centuries. And I'm always puzzled, why can't we think of the future of the city as a city we already have? The city that we can renovate on our own as residents, rather than wholesale knocking down and building up large structures in the name of the future city. So I'll end there because time is out, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. It's very difficult to know how to better follow that. Um, First, say thank you very much. It was a, it was a super, uh, super account, and um, I, I think um, normally you know you just predict and ask questions. So what I thought I would do is maybe offer what I, I could call five footnotes or something like that that would uh, enrich and uh, certainly um, I would I'm not in a position really to argue, so it's going to be a little bit dull, I'm afraid. But I'll give you five footnotes perhaps. The first thing to say is that um, I'm an architect, and an architect is very complicit precisely with the processes that uh, Mike has outlined. So the downside of being an architect is often we are the very agents of the, the dangerous future cities that we saw on the last slide. So the MIT uh, example by Frank Gehry uh, is, a, is a kind of crazy kind of uh, outcome of an architectural imaginary connected directly with, in that case, kind of knowledge-driven knowledge kind of capital. And we see examples of that all over the world. The upside of being an architect is that um, you're also an eternal optimist. And also, being an optimist, you can also be the agent of, of, of destruction. But architects are also agents of, uh, that they have a particular claim on the imagination. And in the right way, I, I certainly believe, and many of my colleagues that I work with, believe in the kind of power of, of the imagination in a kind of criti critical capacity. The other thing that architects do is that they're also quite, quite closely uh, connected, not directly connected, but closely connected to processes of making. So they're not makers, they're not builders, but they make drawings that builders make with, and resident community and community groups make. So architects are kind of interestingly positioned in the overall kind of framework of contemporary discussions of, of cities. Um, the first thing I thought I would say is, is why this is an important topic here now in, in this place. 
So the first thing, I'm sure many of you know this, if you, if you work on the field or you take a kind of a passing interest in the field, urbanization is happening all around us now, and it has happened in Europe and America. So in a way, it's become a historical process in the West, uh, and uh, Mike talked about shrinking cities uh, in Japan, but if you go to Manchester and Liverpool, the centers which, which were the, where, where the birth, uh, where, where urbanization happened first, with industrialization. Those cities are grappling with radically different issues that we would find here today uh, all around us. So gentrification, sustaining dying cities, shrinking cities, is one of the kind of big debates in, in many cities in Europe. Um, and if we follow the kind of graphs, again, one of the graphs that Mike showed, um, it's very clear that urbanization happened, the bulk of that 50% mark that we know between the ratio between urban and rural populations that was reached as a globe around 2007-8, that was reached in the 19th century in the United Kingdom. It was reached before the war in the United States and South America. Um, it was reached uh, uh, much, much later in many of our other parts of the world and has yet to be, uh, uh, yet to be really, uh, reached in Africa and uh, uh, East Asia, Southeast Asia and South Asia. So the point is urbanization is still to come in the parts of the world that, we, that we're living in. Singapore is a particularly uh, uh, tricky kind of situation in that story. But all around us, the question of urbanization is pressing. The question of urbanization uh, is large in scale and pressing in urgency. The rate of urbanization is the fastest it's ever been anywhere in the world at any point in human history. Now what that means is the relevance of this kind of discussion is it's precisely the language by which we used to think through cities the legacy, the intellectual legacy, the legacy of practicing, making cities, all of that stuff that, that has bequeathed to us here in this place from the United States, from Europe. In fact, its, it's, it's, it's relationship to the contemporary kind of question of urbanization is, is it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. Its relevance is, is something that we have to question. In other words, in what respect can we apply the concepts and the ways of making, the ways of managing, the ways of sustaining cities that were relevant in Europe and North America to the situation that we find ourselves all around us here in East Asia and Southeast Asia. So the urgency of thinking that the city afresh in its own terms, a kind of indigenous kind of theory, to use a kind of conflictual uh, term, in fact is more urgent than ever. So this kind of uh, discussion that we're having this evening is super important in this particular place, in this particular time. The second thing I want to talk about is um, something we could, we could come back to the very beginning of, of Mark's lecture where we talked about the, the polis and, and the citizen. Uh, and the legacy, again, to kind of think through this kind of framework in adopting some of the general principles but also being critical of them at the same time, we would ask who today uh, is a citizen? So in the case of the polis, which is one of the kind of most famous examples and remains to this day a central theoretical kind of basis for many discussions about cities and, and urbanization processes. The question of the polis, the idea of the representative citizen at the center of that, it still remains very, very powerful. But the idea already at the very beginning of the polis, uh, of the citizen body, already had its exclusions. So women and slaves were excluded as citizens from the polis, and we know that this issue remains still to this day a very complex and vexed one, at the very center of one of the central, central terms by which we discuss uh, 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 a civic space. Now there's a long and complex European history to this debate, so I, we, I, I might mention here um, Hannah Arendt talking about the idea of the city being a kind of space of appearance where I appear to someone else and someone else appears to me, to me and the important uh, point that she brings in this, in this argumentation is really that about the anonymity of that relationship and the fact that city brings people together who have not previously been together. So the possibility of the kind of meeting of strangers as we discussed uh, before, before this, uh, uh, this lecture this evening. So the idea of bringing people together who have not yet been together and the production of new kinds of communities, new ways of being, new dynamic conditions becomes central to this idea. Um, of the polis in, in Hannah Arendt's terms. Now, one of the important consequences of that is not that we're all simply present, co-present to each other in some kind of organic community sense, but there is a certain kind of theatricality that becomes important in this idea of the city. 
And this is not something that Arendt develops in itself, but many other theorists around this, this, this idea also kind of develop the question of theatricality. So when we think about a woman like a theorist like Jane Jacobs, for example, she has a very famous phrase about the choreography of the street. So the theatricality of the street, the choreography of the street, all of these things for me are important complications about the idea of an organic whole. The city is not merely an organic whole, but a complex coming together, a negotiation which involves clearly a kind of theatricality, which is a very important aspect of the question of, of, of community formation in an urban setting. And just keep in mind, this is especially important where we are, where we are, uh, where we are now, in this, in this particular time, in the coming decades, in this particular part of the world. So city as theatre would be the second sort of footnote I would add. Um, the third footnote I would add would be um, to think about the cities that we've never heard of. Um, we, we can all think of cities, for example, in a way that, that the central kind of cities that come to mind when we think about the questions of urbanization and the urgency of, those, of, of, of that situation. Um, we can think about Jakarta, we can think, of course, about Mumbai, Seoul, um, uh, Cairo, the kind of mega cities which, which the United Nations defines as any city with a, with a population of 10 million or more. But if you look into the, into the graphs of, of, of the United Nations uh, and their studies of populations and urbanization processes, they say that 60% of all future cities uh, in the coming decade, uh, in, this, in, in the coming urbanization, uh, decade of urbanization, um, will be occurring in cities which are under half a million in scale. Now, you can go to Wikipedia and there's a very, very beautiful chart that shows you the names of those cities which are under half a million and uh, uh, I, would, I would challenge you to recognize more than 10% of the names in that list. So in other words, these are anonymous cities. These are not cities which tend to be studied. They tend, these are cities which, not, which don't get the academic attention in, in, one, in, in the current kind of urbanization debate. Yet the United Nations shows that these are the cities that are going to be, uh, are going to be at the front line of the process of urbanization in the coming, uh, in the coming decades. So cities we've never heard of. I think is another important uh, uh, footnote here. This could be a footnote to the footnote, um, and this would go under the heading of uh, the city's not what it used to be. And this is a development of the same kind of idea, and it's also already present in, in many of my, uh, the slides that Mike showed in the latter part of, of his discussion. The city is not what it used to be um, is already self-evident, I think, from the drawings that we've just seen. So the city in Europe, classical European kind of theory was defined uh, as, a, as against the country, as opposed to the countryside, as the urban, as, as a space of excess, which is separated from the space of, 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 of agricultural production, typically bounded by a wall, and the wall itself uh, carefully kind of monitored and, and guarded. Now there are not many cities today which, which have that kind of quality, which fit that morphology. But if you take a cursory glance at much of the kind of vocabulary by which we think about cities today, by which we qualify cities, particularly in those cities outside North America and Europe, we'll find a whole raft of emerging vocabularies. So favelas and bidonvilles and kampongs and desacotes, for example, are very important because they're symptomatic terms which attack and complicate the basis, the legacy that we have in European and North American thinking about the city. I don't think they constitute an, an alternative theory of the city as such, but they're certainly very important symptomatic terms that, that, that demand of us, I think, a rethinking about the way in which we think about the terms and the frameworks and the language that we use to think about cities now and in the coming, uh, in the coming uh, century. So the city's not what it used to be, and that simply is a, is a kind of reminder to us, I guess, certainly I often think about this as a, as a, as a, as a framework to to say, what are the terms that we can that we can hold on to? What are the terms that we can continue to use uh, uh, in, as, as a global kind of discussion of the city? And what are those terms that we have to problematize? And what are those terms that we have to abandon? Um, a fourth um, a fourth footnote uh, again is thematically around uh, in the same sort of neighborhood. If the city is no longer regarded as simply the other or the opposite to its hinterland. Uh, then we have to think about the question of urbanization through the countryside. And we have to do that because 
as, we, as we've seen, if, if, the, if the urban population is increasing, then it's very simple. Uh, we know that the, the rural population is decreasing. And if the urban population is increasing, then who's feeding, who's growing the food to, to feed the urban population, the larger urban population? This means that the question of urbanization is inherently, today, a question of the countryside as much as it is of the downtown regions as well. So the question of food and hinterland is a radical reorientation about the relationship of the city. The city no longer now stops at the, at the wall. It certainly doesn't stop at the airport, even. Uh, it really is a kind of a, a global urbanization of the hinterland. And this means we have to think through uh, um, uh, what, what, what many scholars have called the, in the other inconvenient truth, which is the kind of production of the, kind of like the whole of the planetary uh, uh, hinterland. Um, a very simple and very powerful drawing that I've seen recently is that uh, there are some, I don't remember the exact figure, but something like over 5,000 different kinds of vegetables in the world. Three represent 60% of the global intake, and they happen to be rice, maize, and wheat. Uh, each of these has powerful consequences for the relationship between the city and the countryside, depending on what, what's grown in that countryside. The bulk of the world's urbanization, as we saw from Max Max earlier, are happening in regions where the rice, where the, where the hinterland uh, uh, is predominantly rice growing. So that means is another kind of factor which, which, which shifts the way we have to think about urbanization processes and the vocabulary by which we think about cities in situations where hinterlands are, are rice growing rather than, for example, the Midwest where it's primarily maize and, maize and wheat. So to think about urbanization in Iowa has to be a different question to think about urbanization, uh, for example, uh, in Jakarta. Um, the final one really brings me back to my first, this is the final kind of footnote, this brings me back to my, my first uh, uh, confession of being an architect. Uh, architects, as I, said, as I said, are optimists, um, and there's a fantastic situation that's, that's brewing in Jakarta at the moment. For those of you who follow uh, the news in Jakarta, you know that there is a, a new governor elected against the odds, uh, a radical outsider, uh, another, an insider in other ways, because he's, he's Javanese, he's uh, old school Javanese, uh, uh, cut his teeth in, in the city of Solo, um, uh, was, was elected against the odds against a, a, a serious insider in, in the figure of Fauzi Bowl. Fauzi Bowl is the outgoing governor, uh, architect trained and uh, graduate planner, um, had very little effect on, on uh, Jakarta's main problems, which is rampant uh, privatized growth and, and traffic jams. Uh, the first day, uh, Joko Widodo, is, is the name of the incumbent, his first day in office uh, was to cancel a series of public high-rise housing programs and to go and visit the slums in the very center of the city uh, on the banks of the Chilul River. Uh, the second thing he did, I think, on, on um, the first thing he did on his second day was to visit the mayoral offices at 8 o'clock in the morning to check uh, uh, who, who, was in, who was in office. Um, and he was surprised to find that many people uh, weren't, hadn't, hadn't yet uh, arrived. So he's, he's a very, very kind of interesting, uh, interesting figure. And it's interesting to me because in a way he's, he's not a trained architect, but I think he's, he's operating as an architect. He's an incredible optimist, um, and he's, he's behaving in a way which which seems to suggest uh, that he's in tune with many of the themes that, that Mike raised uh, at the end. So he, ins he consulted with the community in the, in the slum regions of the Chilul River, and now he's invited a, a large, uh, a, a wide range of architects and planners and activists to think through what an alternative form of development might be at the very center of the city that doesn't involve uh, a state, state-driven and state-delivered uh, mass house, housing programs. Thank you.